Welcome back everyone. So today what we're going to talk about is financial statement analysis. We've spent a great deal of time talking about the three primary financial statements, the balance sheet, the income statement, the statement of cash flow. And now what we want to do is take that knowledge and apply it to analyzing financial statements. To motivate our discussion, I've got a stock plot of Walmart and Starbucks. On the top we have Walmart. On the bottom, the green line, we have Starbucks. And then by as comparison, we have the Dow Jones Industrial Index. Now what you will notice about the stock plot is that as we entered the recession, what we saw was that Walmart stock price actually increased pretty considerably as shoppers switched from shopping at department stores to buying their basics at Walmart. As we entered the recession, what also happened was people had less disposable income and so they moved from purchasing their coffee, say, at Starbucks to perhaps Dunkin' Donuts or McDonald's. So as a consequence of that, we saw a decline in the stock price of Starbucks. Then, as we emerged from the recession, you'll notice that Starbucks' stock price increases pretty considerably and it hasn't continued on that trajectory, whereas Walmart tended to drift sideways as we emerged from the recession. And so what we want to do today is to spend some time trying to understand whether the financial statements capture information about those key trends that were affecting those firms. So with that in mind, let's turn to financial statement analysis. And there are four key points that we want to tackle today. First of all, we want to talk about the return on assets. This ratio will give us a sense for how the firm is growing and we are going to decompose return on assets into two factors, into a profit margin factor and into an asset turnover factor. And by decomposing the return on assets into those two factors, it will give us good insight into how well the firm is implementing its strategy. So that will be our first key point. The second key point will be to talk about the return on equity. What is the return that the firm is generating for its shareholders? And there we're going to talk about the role of leverage, how firms can use debt to increase the return that they're earning for their shareholders. But if we're going to talk about the use of debt, we've got to talk about the risk associated with that financial leverage, with the use of debt. So the third key point will be to turn to liquidity, the understanding of the firm's ability to meet its short-term commitments. And when talking about liquidity, we'll talk about a firm's working capital management. And then the fourth and final key point will be to talk about the firm's solvency. Not only to meet those short-term commitments, which is the focus of liquidity ratios, but an assessment of the firm's ability to meet all of its commitments, both the short-term ones and also its long-term commitments. So we'll calculate some solvency ratios and there we'll talk about the maximum amounts of debt that a firm can reasonably tolerate before analysts and investors get alarmed about the firm's debt burden. So those are the four key points that we're going to turn to. Now, if we calculate a ratio, we might calculate a solvency ratio and we might have a solvency ratio of, say, 40%. And my response would be, so what? What is important is that we compare the ratio with a benchmark. And there are two key benchmarks that we're going to look at. First of all, we're going to look at time series analysis. Time series analysis is where we compare Walmart, this period, with a ratio, we compare Walmart's ratio for this period with the ratio as it has historically trended over time. So here we have, for instance, Walmart's current ratio going back to 2001. And you can see that the ratio hasn't changed much over that time period. We call that time series analysis. Another benchmark of comparison is cross-sectional analysis, where we compare a firm with other firms in its industry. So here we have a plot of the current ratio for other firms in the retail industry. And what's striking about that is that if you simply look at the retail industry, you'll end up comparing, say, Walmart with Neiman Marcus. Well, those are very two different firms. Neiman Marcus is a high-end department store. Walmart is a discount 
retailer. So it doesn't really make sense to look at the retail industry. It's just far too broad. What you'd want to look at are discount stores. So what we would do is we would compare Walmart's performance with that of Kmart and that of Target. And as we do that, you then would get a sense for how Walmart is performing relative to its competitors. And if it's out of line, if the ratio is out of line with that of its competitors, then of course it begs the question of management. Why are Walmart's ratio, say, out of line with that of its competitors? Okay? So when we calculate ratios, it's going to be important that we benchmark those ratios using either time series analysis or using cross-sectional analysis. Now, it turns out that it's easy to compare, say, Walmart with Target because both of those are publicly traded firms. It's easy to calculate their ratios. It's easy to compare one firm with another. But what do we do when we're looking at a small firm, a firm with maybe $5 million in revenues, maybe as few as 25 employees? There's a very useful site online. It's called bizminer.com. And I would encourage you to visit bizminer.com. A few years ago, I was doing some work with a construction firm. And so I went to bizminer.com. And you'll notice that for bizminer.com, you have detail on commercial and office building contractors. And then within that category, we have commercial and office building new construction, commercial and office building prefabricated erection, commercial and office building renovation and repair, restaurant construction. And the list went on and on. So you get a sense that there's a great deal of data that you can get about other industries based upon looking at bizminer.com. And this data is useful because suppose, for instance, that you want to switch from one industry to another or you want to diversify. Where do you diversify to? It's useful to look at bizminer.com because you would identify other industries into which you want to diversify based upon the profitability of those industries. Another reason for looking at bizminer.com is that you might see that your competitors are paying their suppliers every 45 days, whereas you might be paying your suppliers every 25 days. Well, if your competitors can get away with paying their suppliers every 45 days, maybe you want to follow suit. So bizminer.com gives you good insight into the behavior of other firms that are equally sized as your own firm within the industry. So, against that background now, let's turn to business analysis or financial statement analysis. The key feature of financial statement analysis is that we have to understand the firm's strategy because the profile of ratios that we calculate is a function of the firm's strategy. It gives us insight into the firm's strategy. And how we evaluate a firm and its profile of ratios is a function of its strategy. So we need to keep the firm's strategy in mind. Now, we're still operating in tough economic times and it turns out that there are some ratios that are particularly successful, even in hostile environments. And so what I did was, I looked at the strategy research to get a sense for what types of ratios could be useful to you and I as we think about offering advice to firms or as we think about managing our own firms. There's an interesting article in the Harvard Business Review. It's written by William Hall back in 1980. And he looks at strategies that were successful and strategies that were not successful in the 1970s. Now, you might wonder, what have the 1970s got to do with the time period in which we're living now? Surely that's just dated work. It's not, it doesn't have much relevance. Well, it turns out the 1970s were tough economic times. Do you know during this most recent recession, during the financial crisis, the unemployment rate was at a height of 10.6%. During the 1970s, the unemployment rate actually spiked at 10.8%, higher than what it, what it was during this most recent financial crisis. We think of a change in the corporate environment, much higher or intense foreign competition. Well, if we think back to the 1970s, that was when the Japanese car manufacturers first entered the United States. And just think about the massive dislocation it caused here in the United States. We think about the bailout program for GM and for Chrysler. Well, back in the 1970s, the government actually guaranteed the debt of Chrysler. So, there is much to be learned from the 1970s. It has relevance even today. The 1970s were tough economic times, but there are two types of strategies that are successful even in those tough economic times. The first type of strategy that firms follow and which is successful for firms is to aim for a low cost position. 
So you offer your product as inexpensively as you can with the hope of attracting customers to your product. And so while your margins are quite low, you have very high asset turnover. And when you take the product of your margins and your asset turnover, you have a very nice return on assets. So the first key strategy that firms follow that's tremendously successful is to aim to be a low-cost provider of a service or of a good. Okay? The second strategy that firms follow that is useful and profitable for firms is to offer a quality differentiated product or service. The idea there is that you have higher margins. You charge more for your product. Now, it's true you might have fewer customers, but you charge more for your product. And so, therefore, when you take the product of a higher profit margin and slightly lower asset turnover, the product of that gives rise to a nice return on assets. Now, if we think of a firm that is pursuing a low-cost position strategy, we think of Walmart. Walmart is trying to offer its products at everyday low prices. It tries to price its products competitively with a view to winning over customers from the more expensive department stores. So they have a low-cost position strategy. If we think of a firm that's trying to offer a quality differentiated product, Starbucks comes to mind. They charge premium prices for premium coffee. And of course, you and I might want to go to Dunkin' Donuts or to McDonald's if we want to spend a little less on a cup of coffee. But maybe the quality isn't as high. So if we think of a firm offering a quality differentiated product, we would think of Starbucks, for instance. Now, I don't view Walmart and Starbucks as being competitors. I just use those as two firms that illustrate those two different strategies that firms are pursuing. Indeed, these are the two generic strategies that Michael Porter refers to in his book, Competitive Strategy, one of the most famous management books or books on strategy. And he emphasizes these two generic strategies, pursuing a low-cost position or pursuing a quality differentiated product. So, as we turn to analyze our ratios, what we're going to do is we're going to keep in mind that firms are pursuing different types of strategies, but on the one end of the continuum, we have firms pursuing a low-cost position strategy, and on the other end of the continuum, we have firms pursuing a quality differentiated strategy. And what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the return on assets, the return on equity, and those two ratios are going to give us insight into how well the firm is performing its strategy or implementing its strategy. Because if, if the firm is not implementing its strategy well, then we might have to adjust our evaluation of the firm, or we might have to adjust the firm's strategy, because the strategy isn't working well in that environment. So we're going to use return on assets and return on equity as metrics of how well the firm is implementing its strategy. So with that said, let's now turn to our four key measures of performance that we're going to calculate.